thank you for joining us tonight and for supporting our Prize Places Lecture Series. I'm Robert Gonzalez, the director of the Texas Tech College of Architecture here in El Paso. I'd also like to begin by thanking the El Paso Museum of Art and the city's museum and cultural affairs department for making this lecture and our partnership possible. This museum is not only the home of an outstanding collection of arts and exhibits, but it is also where we have our Texas Tech College of Architecture Library on the first floor. Uh, many of you may not know that. We have a wonderful architecture collection that's open to the public. And I'd like to um, acknowledge Jennifer Hill, Jennifer Hill, who is our architecture librarian here. Uh, who you can visit with if you come and see the collection. She's also our writing lab director and director of the um, College of Architecture Library. We've, heard, we've worked very hard these last three years to establish partnerships and outreach programs throughout the entire city, uh, but I'd like to uh, thank one very special partnership, our academic partnership with El Paso Community College uh, the institution that's a critical part of our Bachelor's of Architecture degree, Bachelor's of Science in Architecture degree. Our lectures would also not be possible without the generous support of community members, and this one would, is uh, sponsored by Architecture, uh, I'm sorry, I view it as Architecture Incorporated. Please join me in thanking them for their support. I would like to take this time now to introduce to you one of the most engaged and vis visionary El Pasoans, Gary Williams, who I've asked, had the pleasure of meeting when I moved to El Paso three and a half years ago. I've asked Gary to introduce tonight's speaker. But before I do that, let me just say a few things about uh, how he has worked tirelessly to make this city a historically and culturally cognizant city through countless projects that he's involved with. As a senior program officer with the El Paso Community Foundation, he has served as the coordinator of the Pass of the North Heritage Corridor, a project of the El Paso Community Foundation. This project is designed to preserve and showcase the historical, cultural, and natural legacies of the El Paso area. From 2003 to 2007, Gary was directly involved in the restoration of the 1930 Plaza Theater, and he oversaw the restoration and return of the wider Mighty World Sir Pike Organ. He also collaborated with other organizations in the restoration of Old Number One, the 1857 steam locomotive, the 1911 historic sidewalk clock at San Jacinto Plaza, the 1886 Lady Justice statue at the county courthouse, and the Socorro Mission. Gary serves on the board of directors of Preservation Texas, the statewide historic preservation organization spearheaded by our speaker tonight, Evan Thompson. Gary is also a member of the Markers Committee of the El Paso County Historical Commission. He's collaborated with other community partners on the development of over 50 historic markers and wayside exhibits, walking tour brochures, museum quality exhibits, educational brochures, and wayfinding and way signage, all projects designed to illuminate the rich and colorful history of the past of the North. A graduate of the University of Texas of El Paso and the University of Utah, he has lived here for 40 years, but along the way, as he was growing up, he's lived all over the world, from Japan to Panama. He's a true model for what sustained advocacy looks like. Please join me in welcoming Gary. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker tonight, Evan Thompson. Uh, I met Evan in April of this year when he joined Preservation Texas as our executive director on April 1st. I'm hoping that's not a moment of things to come, but they're going to be good because he's a great guy. I'll just tell you on behalf of our board of directors, we are thrilled with Evan and thrilled that he's joined us 
Texas to lead this statewide organization. We began in 1985. We'll celebrate our 30th anniversary. We're glad to have you at the helm. Uh, prior to joining the Preservation Texas, earlier this year, Evan served for four years as the Executive Director of the Preservation Society of Charleston, South Carolina, and served six years as Executive Director of the Historic, Historic Buford Foundation, a national historic landmark town on the South Carolina coast. Evan is a graduate of the University of Texas School of Law on the University of Richmond in Virginia, and in 2011, he was the inaugural recipient National Trust for Historic Preservation Aspire Award, recognizing an emerging national leader in the preservation field. Please join me in welcoming Evan Thompson. Thank you. Well, good evening. Thank you for being here. I'm glad to be in El Paso, and I appreciate the introduction. Um, so I've been in, in Texas now since April 1st in this new role as, as Director of Preservation Texas, and it's my second trip to El Paso in this position. I have to say there's so much here worth preserving, and I made a point of coming very early today so that I could walk around some parts of the city that I had not looked at in some, um, since I'd started, and, and, and walking around south of, of downtown um, really provided a very strong contrast between your very modern contemporary courthouse and some of the very older, early vernacular structures that are waiting for something to happen. And I think that's something that needs to happen is preservation. So I, I picked this photograph to show that contrast. And also um, because preservation is never an easy road. It's always going around behind something or someone to make sure that the right thing happens. And I know a lot of you who work in historic preservation understand that as well. What I'm not going to talk to you about today is significance of historic preservation in terms of its bureaucratic attributes. You know, sending paperwork in to, to Austin or to, to Washington, D.C. To, to get a stamp of approval. And you all do a good job of getting markers. So I'm not going to talk about that at all. Well, I'll talk about it a little bit, but not in the sense of, of what you do. But to start with, this is where I started as a preservationist. I volunteered for Historic Buford Foundation doing research on this house that they had recently acquired and wanted to restore. And what we discovered was that it was built by a, a mid-19th mid century craftsman. And no one knew that in Beaufort, there's this whole community of craftsmen who are working to build the very important structures that Beaufort's known for. And so that's what really got me interested in both vernacular architecture and in exploring aspects of history and architecture that are not the obvious things that people often think of when they go to a place. And I also want to talk to you about some parallels that I find between Charleston and El Paso. And I think that as I walked around today, I felt like, I think, how the people in Charleston in the 19 teens and 20s felt when they walked around Charleston. The people who started the historic preservation movement there um, really took an interest in the, in the vernacular buildings. The artists were the ones who really led the way. Um, but at the time that Charleston's preservation movement started, the buildings in Charleston were about as old as the buildings are in El Paso today. So a century later, El Paso's in a position that Charleston was in about 100 years ago. Um, and I just found it interesting to find photographs that, in the Library of Congress that, that really resemble a lot of things. And this is now a very popular um, restaurant um, in Charleston on the left. Um, and so in terms of significance, one of the things that, that I faced as an early preservationist in Beaufort was how do you deal with preservation in communities where preservation is old hat? Where a building like this, our house museum that we owned, um, was built in 1804, had been a museum for almost 70 years. We did paint research on the building and discovered that in the mid-1800s mid mid it was painted these colors. So in that photograph, this is during the Union occupation of Beaufort. The house was painted that, those colors. And finding new things about old places is really interesting to me. Um, and one of the little projects we did was restoring the small cottage that was owned by a man named Robert Smalls, who was a black congressman from South Carolina, a Republican, who served after the Civil War. 
and again discovering new aspects of, of Buford's history and he owned this house um, after, after slavery he bought the house of his master and I thought that was an interesting story and it taught me that diversity was, an, was a critical ingredient to any preservation movement and then when I came to Charleston, this beautiful city that so many people know about as the, really the birthplace of historic preservation. The first preservation ordinance in America was passed here in 1931. And what it took was both the advocacy of people who'd lived there for a long time, of artists who had moved there, who wanted to preserve its character, but they convinced the people in the business community and in the political community that there was an economic opportunity that would come with preserving an intact historic place. And they bought into that and it's proved itself um, to be very successful. But again, preservation, I'm coming in relatively young to a community that's been preserving its, itself for 100 years. What do you do? Well, preservation takes on a different character in Charleston. Some of the issues involve things like cruise ships having too many people coming to the city and things that are bigger than the city itself. So that was one of the issues we dealt with. We were also looking at issues related to adaptive use. What happens when a church is no longer a church? In this case, someone wanted to buy this historic church and turn it into their house. And we led a campaign with the support of the mayor and the local congregation to buy, to buy that church and keep it a church, and that was a success. And, and you see a lot of that situation here in El Paso of churches that need to be adaptively used. But preservation in, in Charleston um, moved into the realm of the vernacular. These are some late 1890s cottages that are neglected, but very important parts of the built environment. Every community is so much more than your landmark buildings. It's a complete spectrum of buildings that, that provide a context for those very good things. To see where ordinary people live, middle class, working class people live, is an important part of preserving a community. And we bought one of those houses and worked up plans, and I left before we got to finish it, but it was a fun, fun opportunity to, to consider. And the other issue that we're dealing with in Charleston when I left was the issue of contemporary architecture. How do you deal with preservation of mid-century modern buildings, like this old inn, at the old downtowner inn, the old library built in the 1950s, the first integrated public building built in Charleston. It was demolished recently. And then we fought this fight against Clemson University's architecture program. They wanted to build this very contemporary structure in an 1840s neighborhood and ultimately they decided not to. Preservation moved into the issues of, of exploring these territories of history that aren't often talked about. This group, the United Order of Tents in Charleston, was a, was a descendant of a group involved with the Underground Railroad. Not something you often think about in Charleston, but we helped them with a marker on their house. And the other thing that I did that I thought was really important to do and most proud of, I think, from my time there was we put up modern era civil rights history markers in Charleston. And for an organization as old and frankly as white as the Preservation Society of Charleston to do that, I thought we'd get a lot of pushback. It was the opposite. It was a really a good thing to do. And we did everything from recognizing a hospital worker strike, and that's Coretta Scott King in the march, um, and, and was recognized for doing that in our newspaper. But also this, I think the most important thing, about preservation, when you look at the significance of historic places in a different way, not just the landmark buildings, things can evolve and, and come out of it that you don't expect. So we decided that one of the places to get a marker would be the Progressive Club, which was built in the 1950s for a citizen education for African Americans. The man who owned it was named Esau Jenkins. And one of the things that he did was he would drive this Volkswagen van from this rural Johns Island community into the city of Charleston and teach people about the Constitution. When we went to put the marker up, we found that the van was still in the back of our and so we got in touch with the new African American History Museum at the Smithsonian and said, hey, we've got this really interesting artifact. It's a van from the Civil Rights era. Would you be interested? And they said, yeah, we'd be interested. But they, what they were most interested in was the back because the front of the bus had so rusted that they took the back off. And that will now be in the permanent exhibit at the Smithsonian when that opens next year. <laughs> 
So that's something that you would never expect to happen. But the send-off was really great. We had almost 100 people show up to send it off to Washington, D.C. So here we are in Texas now, in Preservation, Texas, and I pulled our charter from 1985, and it just scares the living daylights out of me because I'm not doing any archaeology right now. Um, so also, we don't do things like documents and objects and artifacts, and our mission calls for us to do things from prehistory and to, to do things for, that recognize past generations from the present from the future, and it's basically everything you could ever possibly imagine preservation to be. And the question is, well, how do you even begin? And so, you know, I've come to El Paso. So let's, let's begin to talk a little bit about, about El Paso. But first, an analogy that I want to give you. We had a board member in Buford who was a very successful advertising um, guy who'd retired from Atlanta. And he said what he liked to do when he was talking to people about preservation was to remind everybody that they're preservationists. And he'd say, do you, do you have something that you've kept? in a trunk or in a box. And if you do, you're a preservationist. You're keeping some piece of the past for some particular reason. And you know, those things might be, for instance, you might have a medal, or you might have your, you know, your family Gutenberg Bible, or maybe you went to Myrtle Beach and made a scrapbook about it, and it's very beautiful, and you keep that and treasure that. Your Neil Diamond tickets. <laughs> um, you might save that cherished memory, or you know, I asked Gary for a picture of his great-grandmother. <laughs> but all these things that are in your hypothetical trunk that you're preserving for your own reason. But what happens when you're gone? Because everybody saves things for their own reasons. And once that person is gone, what reason is there to save that thing? And so the trunk becomes a problem. Now, if you're a very famous person, <clears throat> perhaps your trunk of stuff ends up in an archive and it's preserved for all eternity, but we know that not everything's going to end up in an archive. Or a white knight might arrive, someone in your family or some friend who just says, oh, I've got to keep all this stuff, this is my favorite stuff ever. Or it goes up in the attic and it sits there. Someone feels guilty or they inherit it. They're not really sure. They don't want to get rid of it because it's associated with the person who gave it to them, so they keep it around. Or you might find someone wants to exploit the stuff, and so they you know, sell off the Gutenberg Bible to the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, or they might sell the Nobel Prize medal to someone else. Or, of course, it could just end up in the trash, and that's often what happens. And I think that the same analogy can be made, as, as my board member was making in a, in a smaller way, with buildings. Every building has an original purpose. There's a reason that it was built. There's a reason why someone held on to it. And over time, those reasons go away. And so the fate of a building becomes a question of, of really, um, it, it's, there's no fixed answer as to what happens to a building. There's no reason for anything except individual attitudes. So, you know, a building might be turned over to the, proverb, the sort of hypothetical archive. In this case, the McGoffin home here in El Paso is, is owned by the Historical Commission. It becomes a museum. It's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, adobe structure, um, residential structure in the city. Or someone may just love the building. They step in and they maintain it and keep it in beautiful condition, like the Trost House. Or a building may just be held onto, waiting for something to happen, like the Capels Building, which is a beautiful building downtown that's just awaiting its future. Or buildings may just be taken advantage of, just rent it for the whatever you can get, use it for whatever you can use it for. It doesn't really matter what you do to the facade. We don't care. Or it could go in the trash. This is really a horrible thing to have happened. But this does happen, and it happens in the face of whatever regulations you might have in National Register. I do want to make one point about National Register, going back to my first slide. There's a book called Cultural Resource Law and Practice. Some of you may read it if you're students. And the author is really a conversational writer. And he makes the analogy of bridges. Important bridges get put on the National Register, and if your bridge is not on the National Register, it's goodbye bridge. And if so much emphasis is placed on national designations, you lose sometimes 
when you lose a building that's on the National Register, it doesn't bode well for buildings that are not on the National Register. And I think that what's a shame about something like this is that so many local people wanted to save a building and it just doesn't matter, you know? And it's just, there's so much more to preservation than just national designations. It's about building a, a, a broader constituency for saving your community and we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, now, what happens though with a building, I'll use the Capos building as an example, is that unlike a trunk of stuff that you might put in your attic and forget about, a building is very visible. And whatever attachments you may have to it, there are thousands of other people out there who have their own attachment to that building for whatever reason. It could be any building, anywhere. And so the fate of that building becomes a concern. What's going to happen to this building? I don't want to see it disappear. What can I do? How can we influence this decision? And one of the ways to do that is through local regulation, local ordinances. But they're so vague. This is from the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Preservation. It says you know, things like changes to a property that have acquired significance should be preserved. I mean, what's significant? How do you decide specifically what's significant? It's really all up to a local community to decide. But there's good news. John Kenneth Galbraith, this well-known quote that, that um, comes from him that says that you know, preservationists never look back and regret having saved anything. You never say, well, gee, you know, I wish we hadn't saved that building. You don't. You always, you always are glad you sh that you did. Um, but he also makes a bigger point, one that's important for El Paso and that's proved in Charleston. And he said that preservationists are people who are looking long term. You're looking 100 years from now because you're looking back 100 years or 200 years and you can look ahead 100 years. And he gave the example of the British in India in the mid-19th century. But they made investments in the historic buildings in India that now are part of India's tourism economy. They made investments that in the short term may not have made sense, but long term it's paid off. And preservationists, when you're trying to argue to save a building like that Trost design building that went down recently, you're competing as a preservationist, you're competing with a lot, taking a long term view and competing with the value of that property, of that owner, right today, right now. And it's really a difficult battle to wage. <clears throat> this is an image that I think um, you can understand, and that is that, that things start young and they get old. And Neil Harris wrote a really interesting book in which he talks about life cycles of buildings. And he thinks that one of the important ways that you can discover the meaning or significance of a building is by looking at its life cycle. And there are different stages that happen in the life cycle of a building in which people say things about it that demonstrates the significance of that building to the community at the time. For instance, a groundbreaking, or laying a cornerstone, or a grand opening, or um, if a building's being remodeled, you know, it goes through a midlife crisis. You know, the building doesn't think it's, you know, good looking, so it gets a new skin. Um, or when the building gets really old. You know, what's its obituary in the paper? Um, and so, <coughs> Much like a, a building, so we'll have two analogies going on. A community does the same thing. The city as a whole, the city starts a certain way and it evolves in a different direction. How many of you are familiar with the book, The Little House, little kid's book? Well, this summarizes the book. In a nutshell, the little house is in a field and over time the city grows up around it and no one wants to live there and finally the house is actually moved out of town and restored to its original context or character. And I think you'll see that that's somewhat what's happened in El Paso, but it's also part of El Paso's DNA. I spent some time looking at old newspapers. I'm a researcher at heart. I love looking at old stuff. And here's a great quote. This is from 1886. Like the sleeping giant El Paso, represents, um, there's going to come a time when it's going to embody this bigger power. It goes on to talk about how it was going to take over Mexico, 
um, and love it to death through the commerce. It was really interesting, but I didn't want to kind of sidetrack into that. But there's a, El Paso begins as a largely adobe community. And I read one account of the laying out of the streets that the reason some of the streets aren't aligned is because they had to work around some earlier property boundaries that included some adobe properties. And El Paso's had a, an interesting relationship with Adobe and looking at 19th and early 20th century newspapers, you'll see evidence of that. You know, in the sense that this old Adobe building is, is an eyesore, even though it's a landmark, we're going to tear it down and replace it with something really new and important. Or when the cornerstone was laid for this church in 1907, when this building was born, the speaker was a um, man's name was Howard Thompson. He said that he hoped to see a time when, when every hall was torn down in the city and replaced with a good substantial house because that's what makes a good society. Interestingly enough, the cornerstone, they actually didn't lay the cornerstone, they stood around the cornerstone and then they laid it later. I <laughs> thought that was interesting. Or the old Overland building, when it comes down, um, you know, they talked about it in the newspaper as being, you know, this is an important landmark, but, you know, it's, it's um, time to go. It's a thing of the past. The inexorable logic of progress, and in its stead will rise a structure suited to present needs. El Paso grew so quickly from that early small adobe community that it became part of the ethos of living and being in El Paso to make the stuff go away as quickly as possible because part of the building of the new buildings was marketing El Paso. Don't you want to move to a place that's growing and vibrant? Of course you do. You don't want to move to a place that seems like it's old and falling apart. And that was part of the whole, whole idea. Yet at the same time, the Pioneer Society, that same time frame, was looking to build a new adobe to put the things that they had collected in it. So, you know, we're tearing down the old ones, but then we're thinking about building a new one to look old to put stuff in. So it's an interesting relationship that El Paso has had in its early years. But in the newspapers, the promoters of, of the city were always pushing to, to demonstrate the progress that was being made. And it resulted in some amazing buildings, the buildings that need to be preserved today. Unfortunately, the courthouse is no longer with us, a true landmark. And this is really the best example of what I would call the, the second phase of El Paso. So the, after the railroad comes and El Paso begins to grow, there's a first generation of buildings that gets constructed. And the courthouse is really the best one. But there are others that were good, but most of them are gone. And so El Paso loses that second generation of building and replaces it with the 1890s to the 1920s and 30s buildings that are really the landmarks that you have today. So this is really rapid transition from birth to maturity in the city of El Paso. And so, well, so this is another example of it. A church grows and the church tears down its old building. But the newspaper writes it in a way an obituary for the old building that says, you know, this is a good thing because it means the church is growing. It means El Paso is growing. It means that progress is taking place. And by 1909, um, this is from a city directory, the important line, I think, is during the year 1909, El Paso completed her transformation from a town to a city with everything in the way of comfort and convenience. So it was changing. And even those pioneers who society who's, who came to El Paso in the first years were recognizing that something was being lost. And El Paso had, was very proud of what was being accomplished. <clears throat> And they, were, they started to measure the buildings and how many stories they were. So you read the newspapers, oh, five stories, and now it's going to be seven or 10 or 15. And they talked about it like it was a family, you know, a skyscraper family taking place in El Paso. This is a wonderful building dedicated in 1912. They replaced their very early temple, a Masonic Lodge, um, and pulled the contents out of the old cornerstone and put them in the new cornerstone, even though the box of stuff was rusted. 
They were, people were very excited about the progress and change that was coming, yet there was something holding them back a little bit to the past, even if it was a box tucked into that cornerstone. The YWCA laid a cornerstone. The women who were involved took the time to talk about all the work that was involved in getting to the point of building that building and put stuff in it that they thought was important. Temple Mount Sinai was a particularly interesting example of a birthing ritual, looking back, because what they did was they took, sorry, they took the old cornerstone, they put the new one on top of the old one, so both of them were together. When they tore down the old temple, they discovered that its contents had been robbed, so they made a point of saying that there was no gold or silver in their cornerstone. But again, when the cornerstone was laid, this is what was said at the dedication ceremony, that this is a monument to the progress of El Paso. And so when you look at all these buildings downtown, you walk around these neighborhoods and you see these terrific buildings built, say, 1900 to 1930. These were the evidence of the accomplishments that the city had, had achieved in such a short period of time. This is what they were most proud of, and they were amazing buildings, and we're fortunate that we still have some today. Now, cornerstone layings got to be such a big deal that um, in 1919, they, they had in the newspaper um, that there was a large crowd present at the laying of the cornerstone at the three-legged stove in the post office. So there had been so many cornerstone layings that they were willing to to make a little bit of humor about it. But skyscrapers were the thing. Progress would be measured in weeks. June 4th, 1910, skyscrapers coming. June 11th, skyscrapers still coming. You know, sort of unsurprising news, but, but every achievement, every floor as it went up was celebrated. And as El Paso grew, they wanted more people to come. They wanted people to come on, on, on winter vacations and so this article talked about the need to build apartments. They wanted to build apartments up, looking over the city, so people would come. They wanted somewhere nicer to stay. They didn't want to just stay in their house. And so you start to see apartments being built in El Paso as, again, evidence of the commitment to growth that underlied the, the, the foundations of the city in the early 20th century. And with these changes, a looking back in 1912. This is a 1962 recap of what happened in 1912, but talked about how the growth in El Paso was changing the culture. It was becoming an Eastern culture, a New York culture. And I think that's an interesting story that may need some more, more research to, to think about where people were coming from and how those people were influencing the city. El Paso saw itself not as a Texas city, but as an international city a city of, with people from all over the world with a culture that they thought would be second to none in this state. The Opera House burned in the, about 1906-1907. Um, an example of a, a really early, interesting, architecturally significant building that gets lost. And of course, movie theaters come and take its place. Interesting anecdote I read, when this building burned, and they were going through the ruins, they found a burned foot, and they thought someone had burned in the fire. But there was a doctor who had an office in here, and he'd amputated someone's foot a couple weeks earlier, so the foot was still in the building. And then, of course, the hotels, the city of hospitality, wanting people to come, bigger and bigger buildings, and then the dollar signs, you know, this million dollar building. It's gonna be the biggest, it's gonna be the best. This is really an example of the achievement of the city. And so every time one of these buildings is neglected or threatened, that's the very DNA of what El Paso is. And it hurts the city in a way that's hard to explain unless you start to think about the origins of the community. El Paso grew so fast they ran out of bricks. In 1906, they couldn't build any more buildings. They would build them up the rock foundations to a certain point and they ran out of bricks. hundreds of buildings being built every year, many of them out of brick, and they have remarkable details. You walk around and look at the, at the smaller scale buildings, not just the big ones downtown, but the small ones around the city. 
the craftsmanship that goes into the construction of these buildings is remarkable. And I think there's significance in that. Build a building today and let it sit empty for 20 years. You're not going to have much left. But if you, these buildings are still standing, and of course these are occupied buildings people live in, but even buildings that are neglected will stay up um, for generations, even if they're somewhat neglected. And the variety and the diversity of this late 19th and early 20th century architecture in El Paso is really something special and it's something you're not, you're not going to find in a lot of places. Austin doesn't have anything like this from this period. You know, Austin's historic buildings are wooden bungalows from the 20s. That's basically it. This is something really special. And as people were coming, people were decorating their houses. It's important to think about the insides of these buildings as well as the outsides. A company like Tuttle, 100 miles of stuff. Talking about the painting that they're doing in the hotel, it was right on the square. But these buildings, as they disappear, you're losing the record of human existence inside these buildings, what they lived with, and how they functioned in those spaces. That's worth exploring. And I think that maybe some of the issues with running out of brick was why El Paso moved to concrete so quickly. It was very innovative. And by building out of concrete, you didn't have the problem of running out of brick, particularly as buildings got bigger. Now, talking about the life cycle of a building, this is a great little building, the Little Caples Building. It only lived to be 31. And when it opened, it was a hat shop. And you can see all the hats in the window. And here's their opening. And they were real excited when this building opened. El Paso is nothing if it wasn't progressive. And this building is one of the most unique in the United States. And these are bold statements to make. It had an elevator and spiral stairs, and you could go up and see the hat making works. And they had hats from Paris. It was a big deal. But then by 1939, the building's just in the way of a road improvement. Something changed. Something changed. Our cars wanted to get us where we needed to go as quickly as possible, even if a building like the Little Caples building was in the way. Now, how did all this happen in El Paso? Well, El Paso had architects. And El Paso had very good architects. And the newspaper is very proud of talking about how El Paso doesn't need to import its expertise to build these wonderful buildings. People like Ernest Krauss, who arrived before the railroad, is probably the first architect in El Paso, took an ad in the paper and said, buildings in El Paso, mine are the best. So he was pretty proud of what he had accomplished. And Edward Niesel, he was an important architect as well. He came in 1882 and he built a lot of important buildings in El Paso and needs to get greater recognition, even buildings that weren't constructed. The old Elks home, this was never built, they ended up remodeling an existing structure for their home. He designed this house for Fred Feldman, and that's Feldman's little um, logo for his shop. He was a photographer and he sold artist supplies. And Niesel designed this house, and what's important is that this house was published in Gustav Stickley's The Craftsman as an example of innovative craftsman-style architecture. So someone like Edward Niesel was connected, he was really plugged in to these international architectural movements and demonstrating that here in El Paso. So that's the drawing of the house and the plan, and these are the pictures of the inside, and, and it still largely looks, looks that way today. Now, Trost. Trost is clearly a superior architectural firm in the Southwest. But when they were hired to do the courthouse, all the other architects in El Paso protested and formed an architect's organization of their own. Of course, they said they invited Trost to join, but they felt that they needed to have an opportunity to compete for some of these public projects in the city, and that they'd been led to believe that there was going to be a competition for the design of the new courthouse, and they were left out of it. But what that says is that El Paso was built very deliberately by architects who took great pride in the construction of these buildings, and they all wanted to have a chance to contribute in, in the building and the making of the city. And the evidence of their work 
may not be as, as visible today, but it's around the city and more research needs to be done to connect some of these architects with their work. Niesel was hired as the, as the president of the club and they organized an exhibition to show their work. They realized that they needed to do some promotion. And so different firms um, promoted themselves with different examples of what they were doing. And so this particular firm, they showed pictures of buildings, including a house that was done for the architect's father in Barrie, New York. Um, or Krauss, whose work was, of course, the best, as you've read the advertising, still around in 1915, exhibiting his work at an older age, um, giving examples of things he'd been involved with. Um, Patton, um, Samuel Patton was an important early architect. He was known as the great opera house architect of Arizona. Came to El Paso and, and started building important buildings and churches and schools. And um, a couple other firms, Butel and Welch, showing bungalows um, or cottages, um, trying to, to promote themselves. But so very quickly, El Paso goes from a vernacular place to an example of an early building, the Pearson Hotel, the courthouse, this dichotomy between a growing city and old ways. Building up this remarkable square, this is much better than Marion Square in Charleston. Talk about that in a second. This is Charleston in the 1920s. Houses on this street sell for two, three, four, five million dollars today. This is Charleston, 1920. No one lived in any of these houses who, who owned them. They were all rented to people who paid nothing. They had no services, they had no plumbing, the windows were falling out. But it was the artists in the community who decided they wanted to save these, these buildings and they started buying them. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the analogies between Charleston and El Paso. And I want to make you feel better about some of the losses that you've had. This is a terrific building, the Orphan House. This was torn down in Charleston in the 1950s after we had our ordinance, after the preservation movement had started. The same thing with the Orphan House Chapel behind it, designed in the late 18th century by the um, Charleston architect Gabriel Manigo. And then this amazing hotel, the Charleston Hotel, torn down in 1959 on the most visible public space in Charleston on Meeting Street. If this hotel were still standing today, it would be the centerpiece of everyone who comes to visit the city. You'd be sitting out on that piazza having a drink every afternoon, but it's gone. And so even cities with really strong preservation ethos and intentions lose buildings. Because sometimes the person who owns the building has a different vision from everybody else. And even though we attach our own significance to places, what matters is really who owns the building. But there are a lot of similarities. This is our Francis Marion Hotel in Charleston, and this is our, our hotel here in, in El Paso. And the only example that Charleston had of early 20th century architecture of this scale of, you, of what you have in El Paso is the People's Building, built in 1910. They actually had to bring the construction crew down from New York because no one in Charleston knew how to build anything like this. But let's talk about El Paso some more. You have some amazing architectural spaces. People should drive for hours and hours to go and see spaces like this. These are some photographs from the 70s. But this is terrific. The Opera House was gone. We lost that. But you have this amazing early 1930s theater. And you have some terrific mid-century modern architecture. And Julius Schulman came and photographed a lot of those buildings. And so you have some assets here that a place like Charleston frankly doesn't have. But look at the transformation that took place. Charleston's original visions had been lost. These were all waterfront houses, warehouses where the sea captains lived, and they moved on, and the houses fell into disrepair. These are now really important places for people to come and see. And this street, this is the 1970s in Charleston. This is 40 years ago. That's what it looks like today. It's one of the busiest restaurant districts in the whole city. It doesn't take much. It takes a concerted effort, but it doesn't take much to transform something very quickly. And this is our main square, Marion Square in Charleston, which is nothing like our main, main park here that's being redone. This is, I think, frankly, a terrible square. And um, there were plans that were done to, to redevelop the square to look pretty much like what you have here. In fact, 
one of the proposals was to build a hotel, and this has been approved in the city of Charleston, that looks a whole lot like what you already have here in El Paso. So it's just waiting to be restored. And you have some wonderful streetscapes that show, I think, a transition. You have a, a very mid-century glimpse down this road and, you, and just walking down to the drugstore earlier today. Um, is capturing some interesting visions of your city. And some big preservation opportunities. This is where, if, you're, if the significance of these buildings means something to El Paso's future, they must be saved. And that's where things like the State Historic Preservation Tax Credit can really benefit El Paso. 25% of the rehabilitation cost um, can, be, can you be used to offset the, your, the state franchise tax. And if you don't pay franchise tax, you can sell your credit. That's a lot of, of money that can come to El Paso. And your churches, I had some fun looking at some churches and looking at the cornerstones and, and thinking about what people were trying to accomplish when these buildings were constructed. They were all carefully laid. This church, the door was open. I couldn't help but to go in St. Ignatius Catholic Church. Who's been in this building? It's, all, it's the most beautiful building. That's today. I just walked in there, took a picture. All painted. Walk in the foyer, it's all painted like faux marble. Just, it's so easy to get to. Just go there next time you have a chance. But that's an amazing space, and everyone needs to know about it. And these are important, too. Because if you don't have these buildings, you're going to have the kind of new development that's being built in this neighborhood. Some of this stuff's not that exciting. It's a stucco box with big windows. They build them all over the place. Buildings like these, these small vernacular structures, these are the DNA of El Paso. These are the buildings of everyday El Pasoans from the late 19th and early 20th century. And if you wipe them away, you wipe those people away. It's like throwing the trunk in the trash. You can't do it. And look at these spaces, these interesting courtyards, these little alleys. These are the places that people go in Charleston, these 18th century equivalents of these spaces, and take all their pictures. And the craftsmanship is outstanding, not just on the big buildings, but the little buildings. This little house, I mean, it's this phenomenal little house. I don't think I've seen a little duplex like that with that much detail on it anywhere. And this little, this little store, and this poor house, this is right around the corner from the McGoffin home, one of the rare, to me, I guess, surviving timber frame houses downtown. But that house needs to be saved. That says something about who El Paso is and where it's been. This is the Knights of, of Columbus building. And I think that if you look back at, at the sort of birthing ritual, it's kind of sad. Because what they did was they stood around the cornerstone and they said, this building should inspire us with a resolve to see to it as far as in us lies that its future may be more glorious than its past. The erection of this home then, my friends, is a part of a great work. And now it's kind of sad. And what does that say about the mission of all these churches and organizations in early 20th century El Paso? Maybe it means they thrived, but they moved on and forgot where they had come from and left their artifacts behind, but were lucky that they're not in the trash. And to go back to the 1914 El Paso Herald, to destroy a landmark is a graver crime than to steal a horse. In all ages on the frontier, horse stealing has meant sudden death. The fellow who splotches black paint all over the Indian paintings and pioneer writings at Waco tanks is something less than human and cannot be written of in terms that apply to beings with brains. El Paso is at a pivotal moment in its development. It can either look back and hold on to its treasure chest of architecture, big and small, or it can just throw it away and move on. But what makes El Paso so special, what will drive its economy 100 years from now, will be all of these great architectural relics 
when El Paso was progressing and measuring every floor that was built with great acclaim. And, and now we see buildings just torn down. It's got to stop. And all of you here are the small band of us that in 1920 in Charleston got things rolling. You have an architectural legacy here that's worth celebrating, and I'm glad to talk to you about it today. Thank you. I want to recognize the two people that are here today. Leslie Bergoff from McGoffin Home Historic Site. A week and a half ago in Houston, we had our honor awards, and we recognized the McGoffin Home for its recent restoration. I know Leslie's been working her, her heart out on the opening of the Visitor Center in a couple of weeks. And then we also gave an award to Jackson Polk, who has headphones on. recognize his volunteer work with El Paso History TV, getting the word out about what's going on in El Paso and its history to a wide audience, really unlimited audience. And so congratulations to both of you again. So thank, thank you. you.